Well, thank you all. Uh, many of you know me. Hello, everyone. I'm Martel Teasley, Dean of the University of Utah College of Social Work. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today uh, to an important college event in observation of Black History Month. Uh, the presentation is titled The Afrocentric Perspective as a Social Work Model for Anti-Racism, presented my, by my friend and colleague, Dr. Jerome Sheely of Morgan State University. I'd like to thank the College of Social Work alumni uh, who sponsored this event, Charles S. Poe, uh, LCSW in Boise, Idaho. We are incredibly grateful for this sponsorship as it allows us to welcome a nationally respected voice to lead this event. Before we begin today's presentation, I want to recognize the contributions of our American Indian brothers and sisters by sharing the following special recognition statement. One, the College of Social Work acknowledges the land that the University of Utah occupies has always been indigenous land. We recognize the rich history of these people and we are deeply grateful that the indigenous people in Utah preserve to protect this land for future generations. And secondly, we are committed to supporting equity and diversity among our students, faculty, and staff in our communications, our curriculum, and our community engagement. Now, I really have the distinct pleasure of, interview, of introducing our guest, and I want to give him a great Afrocentric welcome, as we say all the time. And as Milana Karinga says, you find yourself in a peaceful place when you're in my presence. And if you want to live for eternity, you must build for eternity. And every day is a donation to eternity. Mm -hmm. Even one hour contribution to the future. And as Kwame Ture says, if in the morning you waste minutes away, you cannot make them up during the course of the day. There's an African proverb that says, I came from my town. I came from my country. I gave clothes to the naked, food to the hungry, and a ladder for those trapped in a pit of despair. In fact, I did so good that the old people said, isn't that a good person? And finally, if you want to give to God, give to the poor, for God stands satisfied when the poor are cared for. Dr. Jerome Sheely is professor and chair of the PhD department in the School of Social Work at Morgan State University. Originally from Hampton, Virginia, Dr. Sheely received his bachelor's degree in sociology from Hampton University and his master's and doctoral degrees in social work from my alma mater, and he is also Howard University. He serves as professor and dean of the College of Social Work uh, College of Professional Studies at Boy State University and as professor and associate dean in the School of Social Work at the University of Georgia prior to arriving at Morgan State University. Although Dr. Sheely has over 30 years of experience as a social work educator and administrator, he still is a prolific writer. As a well-known researcher in the area of Af Afrocentric social work, and he really, I just want to say this, that he is the person who popularized Afrocentricity within the social work profession. He himself will tell you he is not the first to write about Afrocentric, Afrocentric scholarship and social work, but his work is much more well known in, in social work than anyone else's. Dr. Sheely's authored the seminal book, Human Services and the Afrocentric Paradigm, and is published extensively in the area of race, cultural competency, and social policy analysis. Welcome, Dr. Sheely. We are very excited to learn from you, your wide array of experiences and your research on this important topic. And we look forward to the discussion we'll have following your presentation. Jerome. Thank you very much, Martel. I really appreciate the, uh, not only the invitation, but that, that wonderful uh, introduction. I, uh, I really thank you very, very much. Um, I also want to thank um, Emily, Liz, and Paige for um, engaging in the logistical work that is also uh, very, very important um, when you're trying to plan a, a, an event. Um, you know, last year was very, a very interesting year. Um, a couple of things came together 
to really, I guess, focus more on racism in social work. And of course, the first event, which was a very tragic event, was the death of George Floyd, and also subsequently the, the death of Breonna Taylor, uh, both at the hands of the, of, the, of the police. And then of course, simultaneously, uh, we have the um, pandemic with COVID-19. And we know that while everyone has been affected by COVID-19, we know that it also has a racial component in that those who contract the disease and who die from disease disproportionately are brown, brown and black. And then of course, we had a very tumultuous election season, as you know, in November, and then of course the Georgia election, and, that, and then of course the January 6th event at the Capitol. Um, so everything is kind of converged to focus more on race and racism. And this is also filtering down uh, into social work. As many of you know, um, the Council on Social Work Education established a anti-racism task force chaired by Dr. Tracy Whitaker um, from Howard University and Dr. Yolanda Padilla from the University of Texas. And, and they had, they, uh, under that task force were four work groups, or working groups. Uh, I think Dr. Bathford chaired one of the working groups. And so uh, they came out with some recommendations about anti-racism um, and uh, really some very, I would say very progressive uh, uh, recommendations. And so we'll talk about some too later on. But anyway, um, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone and, and I hope everyone's family as well during this very, very tragic crisis that we are enduring today. Um, presentations learning objectives. Uh, first, we want to know the origins of the Afrocentric perspective of social work and to know its definition and, and purpose. Secondly, we want to know the core themes uh, or assumptions of the Afrocentric perspective. Third, we want to know why the Afrocentric perspective is a social work model uh, for anti-racism. And I think, quite frankly, a very excellent one. And we will talk about that in more detail later. And also, we want to know uh, the Afrocentric perspective's recommendations for anti-racism and social work education and practice. When we think about the origins of the Afrocentric perspective, we, I mean, the, the whole concept is Afrocentric, which essentially means African-centered or Afri-centric. Afri um, but essentially the origins really is in the cultural legacy of traditional Africa as the primary source. And um, there, there was a great debate about the significance of the legacy of Africa uh, for African-Americans. Um, and that debate was called the herskovitz frazier debate. Melvin Herskovitz uh, was a Jewish American scholar and anthropologist um, and E. Franklin Frazier was an African-American sociologist. But the debate was really over whether slavery had destroyed all that was reminiscent of Africa for people of African descent in this hemisphere. Uh, Melvin Herskovitz argued that the legacy of Africa was still alive and that slavery and the slave trade did not destroy all that was reminiscent of Africa for people of African descent in this hemisphere. In fact, he argued that um, there were several indicators of the relics of what he called the African survivalisms. And some of those relics were found in music, um, in religious ideas, uh, in um, language styles, 
and in family formation. On the other hand, E. Franklin Frazier argued, who was an African-American scholar, argued just the opposite, that slavery destroyed all that was reminiscent of Africa for African-Americans and indeed that the best that African-Americans could do was to imitate, and he used that concept, imitate European-American culture. And in fact, Frazier argued that even the imitation was not that good. Um, and indeed, he argues that slavery created a lot of disruptions and pathologies uh, for people of African descent. Um, and so obviously when you think about those, those two positions, the one from Herzkovich and the one from Frazier, <clears throat> the Afrocentric perspective relies heavily uh, on the narrative and perspective of, of Dr. Herzkovich. By the way, Melvin Herzkovich is credited with uh, helping to start the study of African-American and African studies here in the United States and, and established one of the first programs uh, in, at Northwestern University back in the 1940s. So the assumption from an Afrocentric perspective is that the, the cultural legacy of Africa continues. It lives on. Obviously, it's been reshaped and reformed by the American experience, but that essentially it, it, it does survive. And so based on that assumption, what we began to see is that in the 1970s, uh, several scholars, um, particularly um, you know, people in the area of uh, psychology, history, and some people in social work began to question the um, appropriateness of Eurocentric theories, um, social science and social work theories. Uh, they felt that those theories were inadequate in explaining uh, the behavior and solving the problems faced by African-Americans. And that was because they felt that African Americans, because of the cultural legacy of Africa, were significantly different from European Americans whose culturally cultural legacy was, was Europe. And therefore, because Eurocentric social science and social work theories were based on this Eurocentric perspective, these scholars felt that they needed to construct and advance a different paradigm of social science and ultimately they filled that filtered down too into social work. And that this perspective needed to be grounded in the experiences, interpretations and narratives of people of African descent. And so essentially what they were rejecting was uh, Eurocentric social science universalism uh, that is the belief that Eurocentric theories could be used to uh, explain the behavior for, for all groups in all time periods. Instead, they, they argued heavily that Eurocentric social science and science in, generally, in general was essentially not value free, not objective, uh, and then also they argued that Eurocentric theories um, were also constructed to subtly and to some extent explicitly advance the political agenda of white supremacy by projecting the experiences and interpretations of people of European descent as normative and the experiences and interpretations of people of African descent as deviant. And so some of the um, major scholars in the 70s who began to advance the African Senate perspective are people like Dr. Naeem Akbar, uh, Dr. Wade Nobles, Dr. Linda James Myers, Dr. Kobe Cambone, Dr. Malefe Kete Asante, Dr. Milana Karanga, and several others in social work 
the African Center perspective was basically um, introduced through the National Association of Black Social Workers, which was started in the late 60s. But it was people uh, like um, Dr. Amanufu Harvey and also Dr. Morris FX Jeff, who also was a former president of the National Association of Black Social Workers. But they were two of the main um, people, persons, who began to advance the concept in social work through the National Association of Black Social Workers. So the, the Afrocentric perspective or paradigm or model in, in the social sciences and in social work has really been around since the early, formerly since the early to middle 1970s. However, it really did not begin to uh, permeate the literature and social work uh, until actually until the, the 90s, uh, when I, um, and I humbly say this, that when I began to publish uh, some of the first articles in mainstream social work journals. Um, so basically, uh, we can go back to the 70s, uh, but more recently in social work, in terms of the academic journals, uh, the early to mid 90s, but really the 70s, the decade of the 70s and 80s laid the foundation. So let's define Afrocentric social work. Um, Afrocentric social work is a practice based model that uses the common cultural experiences, values, and interpretations of people of African descent as a foundation or center for helping and healing. And, and this notion of, of centeredness really comes from Alefe Asante's work on Afrocentricity. And he argues that as we think about um, theories and social science and, and academia, that, that we have to think about centering the experiences and interpretations of the oppressed. Uh, and that it's very important to understand that just as other people have developed theories based on centering uh, their experiences and interpretations, uh, so could we. Indeed, George Holmans, who uh, established exchange theory, not only did he not, uh, established the theory uh, based on people. Uh, he established his theory based on observations of pigeons in, in Central Park in New York. So that I thought that that was a very interesting thing. So the point is, is that if George Holmans can develop uh, exchange theory based on the observations of pigeons, then certainly uh, people of African descent can base their theory and paradigm on their own experiences and interpretations. The Afrocentric social work perspective uses these shared cultural experiences, values, and interpretations as ways to address not only the specific social problems of people of African descent, but also the problems confronted by all people, regardless of their racial and ethnic identity. Oftentimes the Afrocentric perspective is, is thought of as just only being for black people, but that is totally false. The Afrocentric perspective definitely is particularistic in that it does speak to the cultural liberation needs of people of African descent. But as we will learn later, some of its core features also a very beneficial for bringing about social, positive social change and human transformation for all people. Therefore, there's a universalistic perspective too of the Afrocentric perspective that we need to acknowledge and advance. Um, finally, Afrocentric social work relies on both micro and macro interventions and it's very, very consistent with social work's persons, 
person and environment framework. In fact, we will talk later how that, why that's so, because the environment and the collective conceptualization of self is so critical from an Afrocentric point of, of view. So let's look at some of the core themes or assumptions of the Afrocentric perspective. Um, one of the first assumptions is that the Afrocentric perspective definitely acknowledges the within group differences uh, among people of African descent and, and among particularly African Americans. But it also argues that, that African Americans represent a kind of sociocultural uniqueness. And therefore, oftentimes we say that, that African Americans are distinctive, but not monolithic. Um, but it's that distinctive piece that we really want to highlight. And Dwayne Nobles, who's one of the uh, founders of, of the modern day Afrocentric movement, uh, argues that Africans are African root and American fruit, African and American fruit. And he uses this metaphor um, to really describe the cultural uniqueness, the sociocultural uniqueness of people of African descent. Now the root part of that metaphor represents the cultural legacy of traditional Africa. That of course, because of the work of Melvin Herskovitz and others uh, is assumed to have survived American slavery. And that continues to guide much of the uh, uh, African-American culture today and its variations. But the, but the fruit part it acknowledges how the terror and trauma of American slavery continue to shape African-American experiences, interpretations, and culture. And that includes the uh, experience of racial discrimination in our institutions, um, and other forms of inequality like COVID-19, for example, the, the racial disparities that we see there. And so that also shapes the sociocultural reality of people of African descent. And in fact, um, some people have suggested that not only African-Americans, but others, but particularly African-Americans are suffering from a kind of post-traumatic slave disorder. That is that although the event, just like in post-traumatic stress, although the event may have ended years ago, the stress associated with, it, with that event is still very live and relevant for the individual and the people who experience that stress, that stress and, and that that stress can be passed on intergenerationally. And I think that's the point to, to realize. So essentially, the African root American fruit metaphor explains or describes the sociocultural uniqueness of African Americans. That's the first assumption. The second assumption is that the Afrocentric perspective underscores the importance of a collective concept of human identity and need. And this is reflected in the, the Bantu or Zulu concept of Ubuntu, um, which essentially literally means I am because you are, and usually goes forward and says, I am because you are, therefore I am. And, and so there's this reciprocity uh, between the individual and the broader environment. And indeed, the broader environment is very critical, uh, and the people in that environment are very critical in shaping one's human identity. And therefore, it's, it's even beyond Cooley's looking glass self. It is kind of emerging of the mirror with the self. Uh, and we can talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. So the Afrocentric perspective, as we just said, um, acknowledges that individual uniqueness and concerns are very, very important. But it does highlight the shared experiences of a group both the group's victimization 
shared experiences of victimization, but also shared experiences of victories. Uh, it's very important from an Afrocentric perspective to not just focus only on victimization, but understanding how oppressed groups, uh, regardless of race, have been able to turn water into wine, have been able to essentially engage in social struggle that has brought about positive social change. This collectivist approach also recognizes uh, the shared experiences across groups, which is very, very important. But the Afrocentric perspective also acknowledges the importance of human differences um, among and between groups, and that this diversity is very, very critical, and that it should not be minimized or stigmatized. The third assumption is really the importance of spirituality. Um, the spiritual component of, of the African-centric perspective is probably its, uh, its hallmark. Um, and it, it's basically essentially arguing that uh, it's really kind of opposing uh, the kind of materialistic view uh, of of human beings that we see in traditional Eurocentric theories. I mean, obviously there's some variation there. We can talk about Carl Jung's, the, the collective unconscious. And by the way, Carl Jung also studied in Africa. That's very important. And as you all know, those of you of the psychodynamic approach, you understand that one of the reasons that Carl Jung was kicked out of the psychoanalytic circle of Vienna was because of his quote, obsession with spirituality. Well, there's no obsession with spirituality in the Afrocentric perspective. Indeed, spirituality is seen as normative. And therefore, it's very important to highlight the more enduring and substantive reality of the unseen, which also focuses on the emphasis of the interconnectedness of all people. Um, spiritual, the spiritual reality says that we are all connected and that we all should essentially, because we connected, we should behave in ways that reinforce the ethic and the ethos of caring and sharing. And this should govern our behavior towards one another. Indeed, the spiritual component is really, uh, as I said before, probably the most critical of the Afrocentric perspective but as it relates to the Afrocentric perspective as an anti-racist model for social work, then we have to look at this fourth assumption. The Afrocentric perspective considers white supremacy as the primary reason for racial inequality and its resultant problems. Um, the Afrocentric perspective sees views white supremacy as a ubiquitous source of social injustice. Now let's just pause here for a moment. The Afrocentric perspective does recognize other forms of racism, um, no doubt. But the one that is most pervasive in the United States and the one that, that really speaks to uh, the needs of, of, of Afrocentrists is really white supremacy because it was white supremacy or Eurocentric domination that they were critiquing when they were critiquing those theories that we were talking about before. Um, and so um, white supremacy is, is a major focus of the research and the efforts of Afrocentrists. And this is what makes it a, a very great model for social work, anti-racism work. At the heart of white supremacy, and I don't want to give you a bunch of definition, um, but I'm trying to simplify this. At the heart of white supremacy is really the creation and institutionalization of distortions of human potential and self-worth. And essentially what these distortions do is that they racialize, they're racialized and they promote the idea that essentially people of European descent or white people 
have unlimited potential and self-worth because they are considered to be superior, inherently superior, while people of color, uh, in this case, um, African-Americans, are perceived as being inherently inferior with little or no potential, or at least the potential is not equal to the potential of people of European descent. So these distortions uh, become institutionalized. And then of course, we have to talk about um, how they're manifested both externally and internally. And so, as I said before, the Afrocentric perspective is an excellent model for anti-racism. And that's because of its focus on, on white supremacy and Eurocentric domination. And indeed, if you think about the theories that are dominant in social work education today and practice, um, you, a lot of people now talk about critical race theory, but with all due respect to critical race theory, Afrocentric theory predates critical race theory in terms of its application uh, in social work. But Afrocentric theory, critical race theory, and then later on intersectionality theory are really three big ones from my vantage point that, that really speak to anti-racism. And, and the Afrocentric perspective is really a great model as well. When we think about the, the white supremacy, I mean, we can we could talk about all kinds of um, uh, dimensions of white supremacy, um, but essentially, I just want to focus on uh, the ones uh, that are external and internal expressions of white supremacy, and then the overt and covert dimensions of white supremacy. When we think about the external expressions of white supremacy, these are these are the manifestations in our social broader social institutions. These are, are found in the institution of housing, in, in employment, uh, in education, um, and in, in healthcare. Um, and and what happens is that essentially there are systemic blocks, impediments that prevent opportunities for um, African-Americans and other people of color. And in fact, what, what these, uh, what these uh, institutions subtly say, and in fact, some of them more explicitly, that they begin to institutionalize the distortion of that white people essentially are the best at being successful. It doesn't say that, that black indigenous and people of color cannot be successful, Again, it says, who can be most successful? And again, this is a distortion, but this distortion gets institutionalized in our, in our uh, social institution. And so when you think about a, a distortion about success, we all make mistakes as we, we move into success. And even if we're not successful, but one of the things that this distortion does is that it gives whites relative to people of color um, the benefit of the doubt when they make mistakes. Uh, and so that gives you an edge. Um, as Peggy McIntosh in her great essay, I know many of you are familiar with Peggy McIntosh's 1989 essay on white privilege, but essentially this is one of the pieces of white privilege. One of the components is that you can make a mistake and, and people, of course, will give you the benefit of the doubt. I am very convinced that if on January 6th, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be political here, but I guess I already have been, but on January 6th, if that had been a Black Lives Matter protest, I'm not too sure that people would have gotten out of there alive, meaning that the protesters. I think we saw how, how the Capitol Police treated the protesters. Some of them were taking selfies with the protesters. Some of them were doing, in fact, I live in the DC area. They're saying, they're suggesting that it was an inside job. 
and that many of the Capitol Police officers knew that this was coming. But what I'm suggesting is that even protest becomes racialized. And, and I think that there would have been a different outcome if it had been in January 6, a Black Lives Matter protest with mostly Black African-Americans or even a multiracial group. Um, I think that there would have been more shooting and quite frankly, more killings. Um, but because of the, the benefits as, as uh, Peggy McIntosh talked about back in 1989, the privileges of, of whiteness, um, these people were given the benefit of the doubt. And, and in fact, I think only one person, one of the protesters was shot and unfortunately uh, killed. So this is an example of what we're talking about here. Um, we also need to look at and focus on the internal expressions of white supremacy. And of course, those are um, the expressions that are found in our, in our minds, in our psyches, um, that, that create these mental distortions. And from an Afrocentric perspective, these distortions of superiority and inferiority can be conscious or unconscious but essentially they can be internalized. And, and obviously both are dehumanizing, but, but there is a political advantage for those who believe that they are racially superior, right? There's a political advantage there. Um, but, but psychological distortions of superiority are just as damaging as psychological distortions of inferiority. Um, and so it's very important for us to, to focus on that. A big part of the Afrocentric thrust is really to focus on the internalized white supremacy or racism of Black people. That is the degree to which African Americans are uh, engaged in a kind of self-degradation, uh, a kind of self-embarrassment, um, a kind of self-alienation, a racial alienation of, of uh, and ultimately some of the psychologies even suggest racial self-hatred. And so internalized racism can be very, very devastating, both on the superiority side, as Peggy McIntosh talked about in that great essay, but also on the inferiority side as well. We also need to look at the, both the overt and covert dimensions of, of white supremacy and, and how those uh, distortions are manifested. Obviously the overt dimensions are very explicit and, and the covert di dimensions of course conceal and cloak. I grew up on, at the tail end of segregation in Virginia and I can tell you that I didn't experience any kind of covert white supremacy. I experienced straight up, explicit, overt white supremacy. Um, my father was a Baptist minister and pastor and activist in the city. And the mayor and the police chief would get on the radio and TV and, and call us the N-words uh, and, and refer to my father and the other ministers in that way, um, uh, as we walked to school in, in the morning, we had to go through white neighborhoods. And that's where I learned how to fight. I learned how to fist fight um, because we had to go through, we had to walk through the white neighborhoods to get to the schools and they would be calling us N words and coons and we would fight back to get to school. And so we still have some of those overt forms of racism today. Um, we see an uptick uh, in some of that um, with um, some of the groups that you're familiar with. Uh, I regularly check out the websites of some of the more overtly uh, uh, white supremacist groups such as the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the new neo-Nazis, the new Confederates. Um, and they all are very explicit in their concern about the demographic changes in America, 
they believe they, they feel that the grounding of America is a threat, um, not only to the political and economic power of white America, but also it's an existential threat. Um, they believe that this is about um, biological and physical survival. And so these overt dimensions of the distortions of superiority uh, are very, 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 very dangerous. Um, but, but just as dangerous, but yet very insidious are these very covert dimensions of white supremacy and the distortions of superiority and inferiority. And, and these are the ones that are more difficult to identify. Um, and, and because everything is so concealed. And so I, I'm, I'm not trying to downplay the Proud Boys and the Oath, on the Oath Keepers. I think they're very dangerous, but, but also just as dangerous could be the internalized white supremacy of Bernie Sanders, uh, the internalized white supremacy of Nancy Pelosi. Um, and, and again, when we look at white supremacy from an Afrocentric perspective, it is not compartmentalized. Uh, white supremacy from an Afrocentric point of view is very organic. Now, there are other aspects of the Afrocentric perspective that I believe make it a great social work model for anti-racism. And, 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 and that they are the, the collectivist and spiritual emphasis of the Afrocentric perspective. The collective focus is anti-racist because as you know, a major driver of white supremacy and racism generally is the hierarchical view of racial groups that, that coming out of Germany, in the in the 1600 16 17th centuries about the racial hierarchy of groups that some groups in the whiter groups are more superior and all the way down to the darker groups but the afrocentric view highlights the equality among racial groups and that while important differences exist and, and should be emphasized all human beings are connected by common human needs um, and, and indeed common human desires. This collectivist focus is also reinforced by the spiritual component that we talked about earlier. And the spiritual component tempers uh, the human appetite for the accumulation of material items uh, that then can be used to exploit people racially and in other ways. One of the concepts that comes out of the Afrocentric model is the concept of spiritual alienation. Um, the Afrocentric perspective argues that uh, Western society, Eurocentric societies are essentially spiritually alienated, meaning that there's so much of a heavy emphasis on the material reality of human beings, and particularly the accumulation of material items uh, and the greater accumulation of those items that we begin to define ourselves uh, by those, those uh, items, our materialism. And so therefore the materialism is seen as a major problem in the Afrocentric point of view and that, that the emphasis on spirituality could balance that out, indeed could prevent the emphasis on the accumulation of material items. And of course, when we have capital accumulation and the accumulation of wealth, then that is a breeding ground, obviously, for uh, exploitation. And we see that, of course, under our current system of American capitalism. All you have to do is look at who's being hit the hardest right now, low-income workers, um, who already were not making even a minimum wage. Um, and so the spiritual component of the Afrocentric perspective is considered very important 
to balance out the overemphasis on materialism found in many of the Eurocentric theories, but particularly the value of materialism that permeates uh, the American culture. Now we'll, we will end with, so what are some of the um, recommendations for anti-racism um, from an Afrocentric point of view? Um, and then we can open it up for uh, a nice uh, Q and A. Um, but essentially there's several recommendations that we can, we can talk about um, from an Afrocentric perspective. And I, I have, uh, I think I have nine or 10. But first of all, um, we definitely need an increase uh, in the use of non-Eurocentric theories and practice models in social work. And we're seeing that. I mean, this is one of the, uh, I was telling uh, Elizabeth that I've, I've been in academia for 31 years, it's hard to believe. I was probably 16 when I started, <laughs> but um, no, I wasn't 16. I wish I could have been 16. But anyway, the bottom line is that I've seen a major, major change in the uh, diversification of theoretical models in social work. Um, we, we, I mean, just look at the journals. I remember when I was in graduate school in the 1980s and you would look in the social work journals and while there was some uh, emphasis on people of color and, and diversity and gender diversity, it was very, very little. Um, and in fact, um, uh, very, very little. But as time has gone forward, uh, we do see more of the diversification of the theoretical base uh, of social work practice. And I think that's been a, I think that's been a good thing. Part of that too has been uh, associated with the increased number of, of people of color and women uh, as social work academics and administrators. And so um, it's very, very important to understand that as we diversify the demographics of social work education, we also can diversify the knowledge base of social work education. However, this, is that, this does not mean that we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. Now, there's, there's a debate among Afrocentric um, folks in, in terms of whether we should totally dismiss Eurocentric theory. Uh, some people say we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. Some people say we should keep the baby but throw out the dirty bathwater. I believe that there, there are some aspects of Eurocentric theories that we should keep and use. Um, but I also believe that when you have a, uh, a predominant number of your theories that are based on some of the core principles of essentially Freud and B.F. Skinner. Let's just call it what it is, cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Freud, B.F. Skinner. Um, and I'm not hating on Freud and hating on good old B.F. But the bottom line is that there's more than just that. And, and even those theories have gone through major transformations along the way. So the bottom line is that it's very important for us to diversify the knowledge base and to recognize that, that the knowledge base is, is not uh, so-called objective, uh, but really is based heavily on the subjective experiences that people have. Um, and I think that we're seeing that more and more in social work education and practice. The second recommendation is that we definitely need to focus more on racism in the social work curriculum as a primary source of disadvantage and privilege. And one of the ways I think that we can do that um, is to, to focus on what I'm calling a racism-centered intersectionality approach. Um, and in fact, what, what gave me the idea about a, a racism intersectionality is really Ibram 
uh, Kendi's book. Um, and I know everybody is very familiar uh, with Ibram Kendi's book, How to Become an Anti-Racist. Is that true? Is, is, um, I mean, I can't see anybody. I can't see the hands or the chat box or whatever. But um, you know that he's been very popular uh, these days. And he came out with a good book called Stamp from the Beginning, which is the kind of history of racist ideas, the intellectualization of those ideas, starting with Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson Davis and bringing it up to the current era. But then he followed up with a smaller book, um, the How to Become an Anti-Racist. And in that book, he really talks about different forms of racism. He talks about cultural racism. He talks about gender racism. He talks about anti-white racism. And I thought that maybe as a model for social work, uh, and since intersectionality <clears throat> is so popular today, I thought that perhaps a racism-centered intersect intersectionality might be something that we can explore and consider using and following the lead um, from, from Ibram uh, Kendi's book. Again, I argue that he's using that because he is uh, incorporating racism into other forms of, of social, uh, political and economic oppression. So that's something that I think that we could, we could consider. Um, by the way, Martel and I both know Ibram and we met him when he was a student at Temple University a long time ago. And he comes out of uh, the Temple uh, School of African American Studies and the department chair of, of that uh, department for a long time was one of the, uh, what people consider the father of Afrocentricity, Dr. Malefe Kete Asante. And so Ibram was trained in that model. And so he does have a kind of racism centered approach but it seems to me he has combined it with intersectionality. And I think that's something that we might want to consider uh, in social work education and practice. We also, of course, need to highlight and integrate more frequently the research and scholarship of scholars of color. And, and again, um, that is occurring more. And I think that's a good, good thing. Um, um, but I think sometimes we still are unfamiliar with some of the work of some of, some of our scholars of co color um, who are doing some amazing work in, in all kinds of areas, um, all kinds of social problems. Um, but I, I do think we need to highlight that more in the curriculum. Um, we have uh, a lot of scholars who who've uh, written in the area of the history of, of social work and the evolution of the social work profession, um, but other areas as well. So I think that's a recommendation that we should consider. Other recommendations, um, and we, we kind of indicated this earlier that we need to hire, we need to hire, uh, and I I'm sorry, I think I misspelled hiring, but please forgive me more uh, black indigenous people of color. Uh, we need to uh, hire them more as social work educators, administrators, and practitioners. Um, and, and that becomes very, very important as well. There's an article uh, written by some colleagues of mine at the University of Georgia uh, that demonstrates that there has been a diminution in the number of um, people of color, uh, particularly African-Americans, but people of color general, generally as deans of schools of social work. So Martel is really uh, very much an outlier these days. Um, and, and some people are very concerned about that. But I think that if we, if we um, diversify the leadership in social work education, then, then clearly that can have a, a major impact on uh, advancing the agenda of anti-racism. 
We also need to do this with social work educators and practitioners. Um, we need to we think about how to diversify the student body and social work doctoral programs, because obviously it's from those doctoral programs that we uh, will have and recruit the future um, a professorate in social work. Uh, in fact, GAID, I'm a member of GAID, uh, is now engaging in um, uh, making some changes um, in terms of its quality guidelines. Um, and in fact, there's a survey out right now um, about that. So we, we definitely need to continue to diversify. Uh, the diversification does help in terms of diversifying the knowledge base, but also I think because of the experiences that uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color have, they bring those experiences into in practice, into the classroom, and into administration. We need to identify and create more practicum sites that focus on the systemic and internalized effects of racism. And I know if the practicum director is on the call, I know she or he wants to shoot me, I'm sure, because that's one of the hardest jobs in social work education is being a director of field education. But I do think we need to try to identify more of these sites um, that focus more on racism. And that suggesting that racism is not a relevant factor in, in probably all practicum sites, but there are some sites that maybe focus more on racism. And I think we should identify those and try to um, place our BSW and MSW students in those, in those field placements. We also need to focus more on policy practice. And as C. Wright Mills, the great sociologist says, and the link between personal problems and public issues. Um, we definitely need to focus more on policy um, and, and particularly the role uh, of the broader political economy of white supremacy. Um, you know, social policy has its limitations, but it also has many, many benefits. Just think if we didn't have the Voting Rights Act of 1965, just think if we didn't have the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Just think if we didn't have the Higher Education Act of 1965, which created the Pell Grant system. And according to some of the recent data, roughly about 50 to 60% of students today are receiving some kind of federal financial aid. That means that if we didn't have the Pell Grant system, uh, we wouldn't have a, a large number of people in school and of course becoming educated. Where would we be? if we didn't have Medicaid and Medicare, right? Where would we be if we didn't have Social Security, um, the Social Security Act? Um, and so it's very important for us to focus on the broader political economy of, of everything, but in this case, white, white supremacy. We do need a racial profiling law. Uh, there's a new bill that's being introduced by Representative Bass entitled the George Floyd uh, Racial Profiling Law uh, a Bill, um, and she's trying to get that passed. I don't want to pick on the police because I know I know police officers, um, and but there's a lot of that, uh, you know, a lot of sy systemic racism in law enforcement. And of course, people are very concerned now about the infiltration of white supremacy groups, uh, extreme white supremacy groups in, in the army and the military, but also in law enforcement. So we definitely need to engage more in policy practice as advocates, as analysts. Um, we need to engage in protest politics and electoral politics. Look what happened in Georgia. I lived in Georgia. I worked at two universities. I was an associate dean at the University of Georgia. And, and the activism there on the ground with people like Stacey Abrams and others flipped Georgia from red to blue. 
uh, they elected two senators, um, the, um, Senator Warnock and Senator Azov. But that took a lot of activism. We need to be engaged more in that kind of political grassroots activism. Finally, there's a big debate about whether we should focus more on race specific policies or race neutral policies. Obviously, the Afrocentric perspective uh, supports the race specific policies, but there's a lot of tension about that in social work education and in public policy circles. Those who support race neutral policies argue that race is too what? It's too, it divides us too much, it's too controversial, and that you wouldn't get the support of the larger white community on, say, a federal racial profiling act, or better yet, the reparations bill that's in Congress today. Um, and then others argue in social work education and in public policy circles simply that social class is more important than race. Uh, we know that debate, that's an age old debate between race, social class and gender. Um, but obviously the Afrocentric perspective would focus uh, heavily on race specific policies but not to the elimination of, of other forms of social policy development. Uh, so just keep that in mind uh, as well. Number seven, we need to advocate uh, to diversify the questions on licensing exams to include more non-Eurocentric theories and practice models. We definitely need to do this. Um, and we also uh, need to make sure that more diverse therapeutic methods uh, can be reimbursed by insurance companies. But as you know, licensing is a very political thing. As a member of the National Association of Black Social Workers in the 1980s, we were opposed to licensing. That's when the licensing movement really began to emerge. And we were opposed to it because we felt that the licensing movement was a strategy to provide yet another roadblock for people of color. And therefore, we also said that the licensing exams were culturally biased and that they were biased towards Eurocentric theories. Uh, I have definitely changed my mind on that now. I guess I've become more pragmatic as I've gotten older. But, but clearly, I mean, I'm not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but I was back in 1985. But essentially, we need to diversify those items. And so those of you who are on licensing boards or have that kind of influence, please begin to look at the ways in which we can change not only even the content of the questions in the exam, but even some of the ways in which the questions themselves are posed. Um, that would be very, very important too, uh, I think from an anti-racist point of view. Also, we need to get the licensing people to share the data as Martel is trying to, um, to uh, advocate for and NAD. They need to share the information and it needs to be transparent. Number eight, and this is a big one, we need to reduce the gap between the intellectualization of racism and the engagement in behaviors that perpetuate racism. Too often, too many of us in social work education, uh, in practice and administration, we often oppose racism verbally, but then we still behave in ways that reinforce that racism. And therefore we have to do something about reducing and perhaps eliminating the gap between the word and the deed, the, between what is said and what is done. Um, there is a uh, survey and I might be preempting here and I hope you're, is your director of the doctoral program one on the line? Um, but anyway, there, Gade has been involved in some anti-racist work recently, and, and I was part of that group. And, and the students, the doctoral students have organized a series of, sem of uh, seminars uh, 
not seminars, but a kind of group meetings uh, where they have gotten together to discuss some of the issues and challenges in doctoral social work education. And they have organized those meetings around, they've had three of them so far, those with uh, people of color only, those with non-people of color, and then they've organized the group with all students. But in the, in the group with the people of color, um, there, there were several, the, the, the consistent theme of the findings, um, what the students were sharing is that too often they had professors who were scholars in the area of social justice and racial justice, but, but they said that they were experiencing marginalization um, uh, from those same researchers and same scholars. Um, and they couldn't understand that. This is a theme in the, in the findings of the groups um, that they couldn't understand that, that how can someone be so prolific and committed to the scholarship of anti-racism and the agenda of positive social change, but, but yet still engage in behaviors that they perceive as being uh, uh, racist and engage in some kind of racial marginalization. So I think Gade is going to release those findings soon, um, but that, that is, um, Again, it's based on the people's perceptions and experiences, but that is a that is a, a very unfortunate finding, but it speaks to that gap between the intellectual and the empirical. Finally, because of the latter, and this is one of the recommendations that came out of the task force, that we need to provide more continuing education that focuses on how social work educators, administrators, and practitioners can successfully grapple with and eliminate their internalized white supremacy and racism. We need to have more of these kinds of continuing education uh, sessions. That is a recommendation that came out of the task force. In fact, the task force is even suggesting an anti-racism commission uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, finally, I, I just have a few selected sources that, uh, that speak to the Afrocentric point of view that I wanted to point out. This first one doc, by Dr. Naeem Akbar is very critical, very foundational. I encourage you, if you really want to know about the, found, the intellectual and theoretical foundation of the Afrocentric perspective. Please read Dr. Naeem Akbar's Afrocentric Social Sciences for Human Liberation. It's a great, great piece. Also, Dr. Asante's Afrocentricity is another great piece, The Theory of Social Change. More recently in social work, Dr. Trisha Ben Goodley of Howard University and the former editor in chief of social work and her colleagues I did a nice special issue in 2017, uh, published in the Journal of Human Behavior and Social Environment. And there are about 14 articles or so. And so if you really want to um, examine some of the recent research uh, in the Afrocentric perspective and how it's applied to social work, this is a great piece here to take a look at. And then uh, if many of you are in child welfare, and so the Everett Chapungu and, and Bogart Lashore uh, book, Child Welfare Revisited, an Afrocentric perspective is also great. There are a few others too. Um, these are some, Latif and Anthony have done a nice piece here where they apply the Afrocentric perspective to youth development. Um, Wade Nobles' work, uh, around Africanity, and this is where that uh, root fruit metaphor comes from, the 1974 article. And then a great book that speaks to the history of the helping tradition in the Black community is by Joanne and Elmer Martin. Uh, and it, it really focuses on how spirituality was, was the, the fulcrum, actually, of the Black helping tradition. 
And then just a few others, Linda James Myers is a great scholar. Um, and she really gives a nice philosophical treatment of the Afrocentric worldview and offers, this, offers it as an optimal uh, psychology. Uh, those of you who are into psychotherapy, Fred Phillips, Dr. Fred Phillips, who died last year, uh, applies the Afrocentric perspective to psychotherapy and is, and is referred to as N2 psychotherapy. Great piece here. And then, of course, uh, I did the, the book, uh, Human Service in the Afrocentric Paradigm, which is a broad treatment of the Afrocentric Paradigm to various issues and problems that social workers care about. And we are currently revising that book and hopefully it will come out uh, next year by Rutledge, uh, Rutledge Press. I thank you for your time and attention. And, and basically I will now take any questions uh, or comments that you may have. Thank you very much again. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the experience. Thank you, Dr. Shealy. I'm certain that the audience was enlightened by your remarks. I do see four questions in the chat. I'll start with the first one. We have about 15 minutes left. It says, I, I am a mental health therapist. I have a client who is a white mother who has adopted four black children. The mother actively fights against critical race theory and doesn't believe in white privilege. Where can I start with someone like this? Uh, is the, is the, the mother white or black? Yes. Yes. The mother's white? Yes, with two, with four black children. Well, I think you have to start with where the client is. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of not trying to impose uh, immediately any kind of perspective on, on, um, on, on parents, uh, unless there's some kind of legal implication. Um, I think that though, uh, you start with building that relationship with her and starting to know more about her. Um, I think that as you build a relationship, you could begin to talk about concepts of race neutrality um, and, and how uh, race is, is very subtle in America, but also very obvious. Um, you can begin to kind of approach her about her experiences with race uh, and racism. And I think you just start by just talking about her experiences and that, not to uh, work with her and try to impose a particular practice-based model, but to really see where she is and to speak to her experiences. Um, she might say, I've never experienced racism. But then at that point, you might want to give her some examples that maybe can trigger her experiences. Um, so that's how I would approach that. I would build on the relationship, um, try to focus on her experiences. Uh, obviously, um, she um, uh, has adopted the children and obviously she loves the children and that's a great thing. Um, but I would start with that building that relationship, speaking more to her experiences, knowing more about her in terms of issues of race and, and ethnicity. Thank you. The next question is, will you, will you let's see, switch, switch to me real quick. Will you elaborate more on causes of internalized racism and different ways to combat it? Well, the, the main cause is, is that internalization of the distortions of superiority and inferiority. But the question I think is, is why, why uh, is there variation among people in the internalization of that distortion? Sure, there is. Um, there's, there's variation in the internalization of that distortion among white folks um, and among black people. I think some of the variables that we have to will have to consider would be real life experiences. I think that people who have more interracial encounters that are positive, right, um, and, and that negative, I think are less likely or will be less likely to internalize. 
but those those encounters have to be positive and they have to be honest and they have to be open. Uh, I think another thing is um, is that people themselves have to be open and be more comfortable to try something new. One of the things that I did when I uh, I got out of school, I, I was at Howard University and I was in uh, what used to be called Chocolate City. It's not called Chocolate City anymore because Chocolate City is now Vanilla Swirl. Uh, in other words, DC has been gentrified. But I wanted to grow. And I had been at an HBCU and in, in a predominantly black school, predominantly black city. I worked for um, Marion Barry in a predominantly African-American city government. And, and I wanted to grow, but I needed to get out of my comfort zone. And so I went all the way up to the North shore of Long Island. And my first teaching job was at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. And it was the best decision that I've ever, one of the best decisions that I've ever made in my life. Why? Because it got me out of my racial comfort zone. Therefore, I was thrown into an environment where I, in many ways, I was the only African-American, uh, in many ways on campus and in classrooms, but it was a great learning experience for me. And I began to understand uh, different experiences from people who were different from me. I think we have to step out of our racial comfort zone and go into environments that might be uh, populated with people who, is, uh, who might uh, be dominated by people who don't look like you and who don't think like you. And so I think that's something that we have to consider. I know it helped me considerably, considerably and I think it would help others too to combat not only internalized racism, but also think external expressions of racism as well. Great. Here's one I'm going to skip around a little bit. It says, I have a number of concerns here, but I will limit myself to two direct questions. Does a focus on the material reality necessarily lead to a hierarchical view of racial groups? And does evidence based practice? require a basis in a worldview that favors material reality? Well, if you think about the research paradigm, I mean, evidence-based practice, a lot of research is based on behavioral indicators. Um, and, and so what we're suggesting is that from a spiritual standpoint, that, that there's something that, that's deeper than just one's behaviors. Obviously, in many, much of geocentric research, the notion is that that, much is, that which is most directly observable is that which is real. So I didn't really spend a lot of time on the epistemological uh, perspective of the Afrocentric perspective, but essentially a materialist worldview is a limiting worldview. And from an Afrocentric perspective, yes. If it, is, if it is not balanced by some kind of spiritual component that appreciates the interconnectedness of human beings, then yes, that materialist point of view can lead down the road of, of racial hierarchy, oppression, and other forms. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to, but if you think about um, and again, I just have to pull on the work from people like um, uh, Maslow and others who argue that the major problem of American society is the spiritual malaise. And, and so we feel that uh, a focus on spirituality balances that material focus. And therefore it gets people to think more about the connectedness of human beings. It gets people to think more about uh, ideas that are more enduring and that connect people instead of ideas that are essentially about trying to gain more items and using those items to exploit people. At the basis of, of oppression is this thing of exploitation. And if you think about the, the emergence of racial hierarchies in Europe, it, it really it comes at the same time when Europe was trying to expand uh, into other areas through the slave trade. 
And therefore the material expansion of Europe needed a justification. And that justification not only came from Eurocentric social science, unfortunately, it came from religious ideas as well. And so I wish we had a little more time to talk about those epistemological characteristics of the Afrocentric paradigm. Um, and I'm again, I'm not a, a person who says we need to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but I do think we need to diversify the forms of research that we consider legitimate. I, I do believe that. And the question I would have is what is evidence-based? Is evidence that just that that which we can see? Is it is it that which is more directly observable? Um, that would be my question. Thank you. And I would actually say that uh, in terms of social sciences, uh, people may want to look at the recent apology from the American Psychiatric Association and its doings in the past and its racial ideology within its theoretical approaches to social science and psychiatry. And there is a question now, should other professions such as social work also engage in such apologies? Uh, apologies. I'm gonna to try to combine- and also, Martel, if you could have yeah. that person who has a lot of concerns, just to email me, because I, I really would like to have a more substantive dialogue with that person. I hope they heard it. So let okay. me combine two questions in one here, uh, where someone says, and this looks a little tricky, what is an example of a current agency internship Ship that focuses on racism. And of course, agencies don't focus on that. They focus on helping clients to solve their problems and empowering people to solve their problems. So racism may get in the way of doing that. And the other question is, what are some of the ways people still behave in ways that reinforce racism? Well, here in the, in the DC area, we have several um, places that kind of focus on race. Again, you know, some of them more explicitly, others more subtly. Um, Progressive Life is one of those agencies here in the DC, Maryland area. But all I'm saying is that when we think about practicum experiences, and particularly for the MSW program, when we're talking about advanced specialization, all I'm suggesting is that, that when we place someone, make sure that they have some kind of experience with diverse groups where also race and racism are discussed and examined as causative factors for the person's problem um, and not just dismissed or are secondary. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't have to say, um, uh, it doesn't have to say, oh, social work agency that focuses on racism. You know, it doesn't have to be that explicit. Although we have quite a few here in the DC Baltimore area, but that's because we have large numbers of African Americans here in Maryland. Um, and then the, the second question was about um, I'm sorry, Martel, the first the, Which, was the first first part of yeah, that, I think. Yes, the second question, and let me pull that up again. Um, what are some of the ways people still behave in ways that reinforce racism? Well, um, some of the ways, I mean, there's so many ways, but you know, a big piece of research that we're seeing now is in the area of microaggressions at the micro level. Um, and so a lot of people are looking at ways in which microaggressions reinforce racism and white supremacy. Um, and, and some people argue that that occurs too in social work education and practice. Um, hiring discrimination is a way is a way that uh, that continues. It doesn't have to be explicit. Um, you know, much of racism in this country is not about racial antagonism. It's really about racial fidelity and racial nepotism. Um, and, and so, to that extent, uh, race becomes akin to the feelings that we may have of a family. Um, and therefore, um, people hook each other up, right? It's the hookup. Um, and, and that's why in hiring practices, you really have to make sure that you have strategies and procedures that prevent, um, you know, the kind of nepotism 
that can occur in any form. But in this case, we're talking about racial nepotism. So we still see that kind of that that kind of experience in terms of hiring. We also see ways in housing discrimination. Uh, we know that people of color, uh, when they see uh, a lender, um, there is the perception um, that the loan is going to be for uh, the loan is going to not uh, um, be paid on. Um, and so the bottom line is that. Uh, there, there's discrimination uh, in the distribution of, of mortgages. Um, we can look at uh, education. We can look at health care. Um, we can look at um, uh, even the, the ways in which uh, there's some subtle forms of, of racism that occur in the language we, that we use and, the, and, and how we speak in the public square. Um, so it can be very, very subtle, all the way up to the more extreme versions. The point is, is that too often we focus on, we say that racism is the extreme versions of racism, the racism that I grew up with, or the Archie Bunker kind of racism, the blue collar, uh, so-called hick form of racism. But I'm just as concerned about the racism among intellectuals. Um, because they have more power and definitely even more privilege. Thank you. That was the last question. Um, as Dr. Sheely knows, we've just really touched the surface here on Afrocentric thought, theory, and practice. And there is a moral code, an ethical code to Afrocentricity called Madian ethics, M-A-A-T. And one of its basic premises is that the good leader comes at the voice of the call. And so I reached out to Dr. Sheely to talk with us today, and he came. I want to thank you, Dr. Sheely. I'm sure our guests have had a wonderful time enjoying you today. I saw many great comments in the chat. Thanks to all involved, uh, to our highly respected guest, Dr. Sheely, for his time today and for his research and service uh, to people and humans. And to our generous sponsor, Charles Poole, our MSW Black class of 1981 for its generous gift and sponsoring today's presentation. To all of you for joining us and to those who've continued to support our emergency student funds through programs such as this. For those interested in CEUs and access to a recording of this presentation, watch for an email within a week. The College of Social Work is committed to furthering our anti-racism practices in the college and community, as well as celebrating Black History Month. Not only this month, but every month. We hope you'll join us for our future college events, including two upcoming events that examine issues related to race. On April 19th, uh, the College of Law Dean Elizabeth Crunk Warner and myself will discuss the book, Cast, The Origin of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. And on May 27th, I will host a Corn Talks with Teasley presentation that will break down the history of policing and review current issues connected with, de with defunding the police. You can learn more about all of our upcoming virtual presentations on the college's event page. The link is provided in the chat. Please join us whenever you can. Good afternoon to all. Stay safe, take care, and thank you for your time.